We are wired for love. It's as strong as a cocaine addiction and even enables us to send our DNA into tomorrow. It is also the least safe investment you'll ever make. If you're thinking about getting into the love game, you better get ready to fight. Forget everything you think you know about love, because love is not what you think it is. While it is true that love is soft and warm and fluffy like puppy ears and hotel pillows, it is also coarse and cruel, like a cracked phone screen or a paper cut on that part of your finger that you literally use for everything. Let's be real here. Love will leave your message on red for days. Love is a trap, a brilliantly beautiful, barbarous trap. And even though we know that, we can't help but walk right into it over and over and over again. And it just so happens that there's a reason for that. We love love so much because we're wired that way. A 75 year study by Harvard showed that the number one indicator for human happiness was the quality of our relationships. And the quality of our relationships is based on the depth of our ability to love and receive love. And so to me, if we're talking about human happiness, if we're talking about human purpose, if we're talking about the pursuit of a beautiful, joy-giving, fulfilling life, then love and the ability to give and receive love is at the heart of that. That's the good news. The bad news is the loss of love is a profound type of pain. On the good days, when it doesn't feel like your entire existence has been trampled on by a herd of elephants, sometimes there is room for food. Even breathing feels hard. There's tension in the chest, an aching in the throat, and a wrenching in the gut. Sunlight? Forget about it. It's dark sunglasses and hoodies for me, thank you very much, from now until forever. So I turned to heartbreak expert, Dr. Guy Winch, for advice. Getting off the heartbreak is not a journey. It's a fight. When your heart is broken, you simply cannot trust what your mind is telling you. Brain studies have shown that the withdrawal of romantic love activates the same mechanisms in our brain that get activated when addicts are withdrawing from substances like cocaine or opioids. You have to recognize that as compelling as the urge is with every trip down memory lane, every text you send, every second you spend stalking your ex on social media, you are just feeding your addiction, deepening your emotional pain and complicating your recovery. Heartbreak is a master manipulated the ease with which it gets our mind to do the absolute opposite of what we need in order to recover is remarkable. <sighs> I know what that feels like. We are wired for love and also wired for loss. But if love is like a drug and the heartbreak that comes from losing it is like being in withdrawal from cocaine or opioid addiction, how is that worth the risk? What happened to say no to drugs? Why would I want to say yes to love if it meant that I might have to lock myself in a padded room and sweat out my sadness for three days just to get over my love addiction? To find out, I turned to Dr. Helen Fisher for her thoughts. Thirst and hunger keep you alive today. Romantic love enables you to focus your mating energy and send your DNA into tomorrow. I and my colleagues have put over 100 people into a brain scanner who were madly in love. The first group were people who were happily in love. The second were a group of people who were rejected in love. And the third was a group of people who were in love long term. So we put these people in the brain scanner. We had them look at a photograph of their sweetheart and also a neutral photograph so we could compare the brain under both circumstances. And we were able to find that everybody begins to have activity in a tiny little factory near the base of the brain called the ventral tegmental area. And that brain region actually makes dopamine and sends dopamine to many brain regions, giving you that focus, the motivation, the obsession, the craving of intense romantic love. And what's interesting to me is that little factory, the VTA, lies right next to the factory that orchestrates thirst and hunger. Well, that all sounds like a lot. What if I don't really like this love game and would just prefer not to play? I get that evolution has built our brains to be hardwired for both love and loss, but seriously, do I have a choice in the matter or am I just a pawn to my dopamine and neurotransmitters? What would someone who's written a book about love have to say? There is no safe investment. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. 
it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, or at least to the risk of tragedy, is damnation. And the only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love is hell. When we give our heart to any relationship, we sign up for the entire spectrum of experience. The joyful bliss of love and the inevitable pain of loss cannot exist without each other. In this way, love is like a metaphorical superposition of the heart, existing in a state of quantum uncertainty, until that moment of observation when we are truly seen by another, allowing our hearts, both full of love and completely shattered simultaneously, to finally come into being. But while this might sound like a terribly unsafe investment, we are wired for it. And the happiness that characterizes being able to give and receive love fully is what brings meaning into our lives. Not to mention the possibility of sending our DNA into tomorrow. So the next time you feel that moment of cosmic connection with another, will you walk towards it with an open heart? I will. Sex. I know your ears perked up, so listen. This is important. We're talking about sexually transmitted infections or STIs. While most people know what STD stands for, these days STI is both preferred and more accurate. As there's less stigma attached to the term infection and because most STIs never develop into diseases. And despite the name, STIs don't just spread through sex alone. Some can spread through blood, pregnancy, or just regular old skin-to-skin -skin contact. STIs are also very common, with an estimated 1 million new cases every day. And most people will have at least one STI in their lifetime. So why the stigma for something so normal? We've seen how the stigma around STIs has caused great harm to large groups of people in the past. Like during the HIV AIDS crisis, in which queer people, notably gay men, were unjustly scrutinized and subjected to violence. But something you may not have heard much about is what was known as the American Plan. Let's dive into this quick segment from the History Channel with sexual health advocate Suze Bubb to learn about it. During the 20th century, the American government had a widespread program in which they locked people up without trial for having sexually transmitted infections if they were women. The American plan detained tens of thousands of American women and forcibly examined them for STIs. If a woman tested positive, U.S. officials sent them to penal institutions without due process. This forced internment could last from a few days to many months. In these institutions, women were often injected with mercury or arsenic-based drugs. If women failed to show proper ladylike deference, they could be beaten, thrown into solitary confinement, or even sterilized. Enforcement of the American plan lasted over 50 years, but today few people have ever heard of it. Even fewer are aware that American plan laws enabling officials to examine people reasonably suspected of having STIs are still on the books in some form in every U.S. state today. Well, that is quite the sordid history. STIs are extremely common, but what can we do to avoid them? You've probably heard the phrase, I'd know if I had something. But since most STIs are asymptomatic, you can't actually know if you or a partner has an STI just by feeling or seeing something. Sex is inherently risky, and while safe sex might not exist, what does exist are safer sex practices. Getting screened for STIs routinely is important, but not all STIs are included. And while physical barriers like condoms or dental dams help a lot, they won't always protect you from STIs that spread through skin-to-skin -skin contact. As humans, we're prone to infections. We can get them from mundane activities like shopping, and we can get them when we woohoo too. The bottom line is, you can still get an STI despite your best efforts, and there's no shame if you do. Speaking of shame, let's unpack one of the most stigmatized STIs today, herpes. Here's what sex and culture critic Ella Dawson had to say about it during her TEDx talk. Two in three people in the world have herpes simplex virus strain one. It typically causes cold sores or oral herpes, but it can also cause genital outbreaks as it does in my case. And many are asymptomatic, but they can still transmit. There's also HSV2, which commonly causes genital outbreaks. That is, I believe one in six people, one in five women, it's super common. And then there's also herpes gladiatorum, by far the most badass name strain of any STI. It's actually not sexually transmitted. It commonly impacts high school and college wrestlers who get it from each other during wrestling matches. Also, chicken pox and shingles are in the herpes family of viruses. Obviously, they're not stigmatized and they're not sexually transmitted unless you're just 
really inventive. Herpes is everywhere, it's all around us, and it can carry this really out of whack, out of sync social stigma. You may have heard that some of the common STIs are on the rise, but their increases are nominal compared to one of the oldest STIs in the game, syphilis. While the CDC noted the highest number of cases in the U.S. in a decade, the U.K. Health Security Agency reported levels not seen since 1948. Australia saw figures rise by as much as 90%, and Canada saw a shocking increase of 389% between 2011 and 2019. Syphilis was almost eradicated just a couple of decades ago and is easily treatable in early stages. So what happened? Most people would be quick to blame promiscuity in modern dating, but scientists actually don't have one straight answer. They have a few. And some of them point to some general problems we face when it comes to sexual health infrastructure and support. Let's dig in with Sheena Williams of PBS Vitals and Allison Marshall, a clinical instructor and nurse practitioner. What happened in the pandemic, I think, is that we weren't able to get people into care. And so people who potentially either had mild symptoms and wanted to be checked, couldn't get in, or more frequently had no symptoms whatsoever. These are the people that we often catch at our well person visits. Now, it's important to say that this is not all about the pandemic. National funding for STI prevention is down more than 40% since 2003. That means fewer clinics, fewer places to test, and look what happened to the rate of syphilis over that same time. That record low that we had in the 2000s was directly related to the amount of federal funding that was spent as a result of the AIDS crisis. A few decades ago, almost 80% of young people were endorsing that they use condoms most of the time, and that number has decreased to 50%. That's a significant decline and speaks to a number of issues, one of which I think that is super important is the state of sex education. Eradicating the stigma surrounding STIs is actually paramount to the treatment and prevention of STIs. That means raising awareness, making space for open, transparent conversations that are free of judgment or shame, and increased funding for sexual health education, preventative treatment, and care. We always have and always will have sex, so we need to accept that infections are par for the course. Instead of abstinence-minded sex education, which fails to address the realities, we need more comprehensive, fact-based education that seeks to inform, not instill fear. The days of showing slideshows of gnarly extreme cases are over. Let's myth-bust common misconceptions around STIs and talk about how they actually work. There's so much to learn if we just move past the shame. So let's take it back to 1991 when Salt and Pepper said, let's talk about sex. Or keep talking about it rather, because silence is still the problem.